From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Providence, Rhode Island calling. Mr. Dollar? Yes. One moment, please. Go ahead. Hello? Hello, Mr. Dollar? Yes? This is Dick Porter. I'd like to hire you. Porter? Uh, Dick Porter. I'm an insurance broker here. Bert Masterson at United Adjustment Bureau suggested I contact you. Oh, what's the trouble, Mr. Porter? <laughs> uh, darned if I know exactly. I just have a client who's taking out all the insurance he can get. I may be wrong, but it looks to me like he's getting ready to die. Oh. Can you help me out? I can try, Mr. Porter. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To Richard Porter, 480 Webster Boulevard, Providence, Rhode Island. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Shepherd matter. Expense account item one, $15. Airfare and incidentals, Hartford to Providence. I arrived at 2.30 in the afternoon and was in my hotel room by 3.15. At 5 o'clock, I was having a quiet drink with Porter, who turned out to be a 24-year man in the insurance brokerage business and seemed to know what he was about. I've never had anything like this happen to me, and I didn't quite know what to do about it. I'm glad I can get some expert advice from you. Well, I don't know how expert the advice will be, but I'll do what I can for you, Mr. Porter. Uh, Want another one of these? No, I'm fine for now, thank you. I'll try to explain this matter as far as I know. Two days ago, Dr. Shepard called me up and inquired about rates on straight life insurance. Mm -hmm. He's carried about $20,000 worth of policies, so 10 years or better. Um, I have the figures in my office. Mm Mm-hmm. I gave him the prices for coverage, and he said he'd take $80,000, which would bring him up to an even 100000 Now, Shepard's a single man. The beneficiary on his other policies is his mother, Claire Shepard. She lives over in Pawtucket. He's only dependent. He wants to name her beneficiary again. I see. Now, where do matters stand with Dr. Shepard right now? I told him it'd take a few days to draw the policies up. He sent me a check for the first payment and told me to do what had to be done. I don't want to act on his application until I know it's okay. Yeah, sure. Well, uh, what can you tell me about Dr. Shepard? Very little. He seems to have a good practice here in town and does his share of charity work and so on. As far as I know, he's above question. Would have to be, of course, to practice medicine here. He has an apartment above his offices, owns the building, all of his equipment. Know anything about his friends? No. Now, let me understand this about Dr. Shepard. He called you. You didn't call him. He wanted to buy the insurance. Uh, You didn't try to sell it. That's about it, yes. And that's why I'm worried. Give me a hundred people and I'll show you 99 out of that hundred who will never, never call up an insurance broker and say, I want to buy some life insurance. People have to be sold life insurance. They'll go out and shop around for fire, theft coverage, automobile insurance, health, almost any kind. But straight life insurance, that has to be sold. On the other hand, suppose Shepard is that one in a hundred. Yeah, yeah, it may be a perfectly legitimate situation. Yeah, Shepard may have looked into his mirror one night and said to himself, I gotta have $100,000 worth of insurance or I won't sleep a wink. Oh, yeah, it could have happened that way, Mr. Porter. But uh, I have to think of those 99 people in that hundred. Sure. Sure, so do I. Well, here's to caution. Cheers. Expense account item two, $25. Deposit on a rented car, which I use the following day, driving from place to place, collecting data on Dr. Charles Shepard, M.D. At his bank, I was able to learn that he enjoyed what might be called a lucrative practice, and that, like most people, he spent slightly more than he made. He belonged to a golf club where he was seldom seen. He belonged to a tennis club, which he managed to make three or four times a week. Questioning the pharmacist who had the prescription counter a half block from Dr. Shepard's building and the manager of a cafeteria across the street from same, I was unable to learn who Dr. Shepard's steady companions were or gain any information that would justify his puzzling application for life insurance. Hello? Good morning. Oh, good morning. I'd like to see Dr. Shepard, please. Do you have an appointment? No, I don't. Well, may I have your name, please? Johnny Dollar. 
Dollar. Dollar. Are you a regular patient of Dr. Shepard's, Mr. Dollar? No, no, I'm not. I didn't think I recalled your name. I've been with Dr. Shepard almost five years. Uh, who recommended Dr. Shepard? No one. Oh, well, Mr. Dollar, I'm afraid doctor's out now and won't be back until late this afternoon. Well, now, that's funny. I was standing out in front of you three minutes ago, and I thought I saw Dr. Shepard walk in. Please, Mr. Dollar, he is not in to anyone. What's your name? Why, I miss Streeter. Miss Streeter. Well, yes, but I'd I... I'd like see... to see Dr. Shepard, Miss Streeter. Here. Oh. Insurance investigator? Yes. Will you tell the doctor that? Please? I... Yes, I... I'm sorry. I had to tell your doctor was out. He asked me to say that to everyone who came in. I'm afraid the doctor's been acting strangely all day. I'm very much concerned over him. Excuse me. The tall, pale brunette girl in the crisply starched uniform was certainly concerned about something. She bit her lip, forced on a wan, unprofessional smile, and looked like she wanted to cry just before she disappeared beyond the reception room to seek out Dr. Shepard. I pretended not to notice that part. One minute passed, two minutes, three minutes. No one reappeared. So I pushed the door open and I looked down the corridor leading to the examination rooms and laboratory. I had to notice Dr. Charles Shepard standing at the end of the corridor. Most of his costume was medically correct. White coat, stethoscope in one hand. But in the other hand, he brandished a 32 automatic. And the safety was off. Stay where you are, mister, and get your hands up. What pocket do you keep your credentials in? Left inside. I'll get them. Insurance investigator. For whom? At the moment, for Mr. Porter. Dick? Yeah. Well, here, I... I'm sorry, Mr. Dollar. I... I guess I'm very nervous these days. Oh, uh, well... Mr. Dollar, I'd like to get your address and phone number before uh, you... That's all right, Corrine. Uh, don't you think this might be a good time to go out and get a bite? Well, it's a little early, Doctor. I have some lab tests. Go ahead, Corrine, like a good girl, and uh, lock up, huh? Yes. Goodbye, Mr. Dollar. Uh, yeah, goodbye. Very fine girl, Corinne. She's been with me... Five so... years, she told me. Oh. <laughs> I don't know how I'm going to explain meeting you in the hallway with this in my hand. Uh, yes. Well, uh, before you try, suppose you snap the safety on. Oh, yes. Uh, I, I look somewhat foolish, I guess... Do you want to come in my office? Sure. You say Mr. Porter sent Mr. You... Porter told me you made an application for $80,000 worth of life insurance. We, uh, we look into things like that, Doctor. Investigate me because I want to buy life insurance? Yeah, yeah. You're a single man with few responsibilities? Well, I don't know whether to be irritated or not. Am I, am I going to get my insurance? I wouldn't be irritated, Doctor. Put yourself in the insurance company's position. They're just not used to this kind of application. Oh, you, you may get it, I don't know. But obviously you're in some kind of trouble, gun and all. Well, I... You know, the whole thing is a ridiculous mess. Mr. Dollar, my life has been threatened by a man who has definite homicidal tendencies. I suppose I've been acting very strangely lately. I, I don't know whether to leave town or give up my practice. All you have to do is pick up that telephone and call the police and tell them about it. A threat in your life comes under police business, Doctor. I know that, and I would go to the police, only... Well, it's a very delicate matter. I have a patient's welfare to think of. You can't very well treat any patient if you're dead. I suppose you sit down and tell me all about it. All right. Several months ago, I treated a woman named Forbes. A thorough examination and consultation disclosed that her poor physical condition was not based on any organic disorder, but rather upon her own emotional instability. Not an uncommon diagnosis this hectic day and age... You've heard of things like this, Mr. Dollar? Oh, I've heard of semantics and neurotics and psychotics, but I'm not a doctor. Well, let me tell you the psychotherapeutic side of medicine is by far the most challenging and one in which I've had considerable experience. Consequently, I undertook to treat Mrs. Forbes, hoping to effect a cure. Are you a psychiatrist, doctor? No, I am not. Don't misunderstand me, Mr. Dollar. In the process of treating Mrs. Forbes' physical ailments, I urged her to recount a variety of experiences... Talked to her from day to day, probing all the while for the source of her trouble. 
It has been my intention from the first to place her in the hands of a competent neurologist. I suspected her trouble early in the treatment. She's married to an erratic, ruthless, ill-tempered man, Paul Forbes. Oh. I made a grave error when Mrs. Forbes pressed me last week to... Well, I could only tell her to move out and divorce him immediately. That's pretty extreme advice, Doctor. I know, but I also know the advice was right. Oh, you aren't in sympathy with me, I can see, but let me tell you that any competent psychiatrist would have advised her the same. I approached her husband on the matter a few days ago. What? I explained to him that Mrs. Forbes' health, her very life, is in jeopardy, that more is involved here than just keeping intact a union which has nothing but legality as a binding force. And Mr. Forbes doesn't care for semantics. He doesn't care for Mrs. Forbes, Mr. Dollar. He ranted and raved and accused me of trying to break up his home, and finally he attacked me. I managed to get away. Did he threaten you then? Yes, he said he'd kill me. Who else was there? What do you mean? Who heard him say these things? Why... Mrs. Forbes was there, and a servant in their home. Yes, a servant. Upton's his name, I believe. You should have called the police. I should have done a lot of things differently in my lifetime, but I didn't call the police. My primary concern is for Mrs. Forbes. Further shock and guilt complex could be totally disastrous to her. So are you going to creep around here with a gun in your hand? I don't know whether I'd even know how to use it. I... 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 Now, why the application for all the insurance? Well, I, I wondered if Forbes might get me. I wanted to be sure my mother was taken care of. I, I don't know whether anyone's ever threatened your life, and you knew for certain he'd try to carry out the threat, but that is the position I am in. Well, what are you going to do? I don't know. I'll think of something, but what about my insurance? That's up to Mr. Porter. If what you say is true, I wouldn't insure you. What do you mean, if it's true? Of course it's true. Doctor, I don't believe it. I left him standing there in the corridor, staring after me. A lonely man. Somehow not as frightened a man as he tried to let me believe. I wondered about that. I was still wondering about it when I went to sleep that night. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, the Shepherd matter becomes a matter even the police can't handle. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Vic Porter, Mr. Dollar. Hi. Did you check on Dr. Shepherd? Yeah. Uh, do I write up his policies? Well, that's up to you, Mr. Porter. Dr. Shepherd's life has been threatened. What? That's according to him. And the man who threatened his life has definite homicidal tendencies, also according to Dr. Shepard. Well, I... I well, what do you think? Porter, I think Dr. Shepard's a liar. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Richard Porter, 480 Webster Boulevard, Providence, Rhode Island. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Shepherd matter. More expenses, item three, 26 cents, one bottle of aspirin for Mr. Porter. I felt he was going to need it. I hope you aren't trying to be funny, Mr. Dollar. I'm not, Mr. Porter. I think you've got a tough decision to make. I, uh, I know that the commission on $80,000 worth of insurance would be high. Uh, uh, sit down. Oh, thanks. Uh, Mr. Porter, Dr. Shepard told me he bought or tried to buy all that insurance because he thought a man named Forbes was going to kill him. He bought it, he said, to make certain his mother is well provided for. He was carrying a thirty-two Colt. Mm. Now, he spoke of treating Forbes' wife and of advising her that divorce would settle her health problem. Mr. Forbes didn't like that and accused Shepard of trying to wreck his home, and, well, that's about it. Now, what have we got? <laughs> Well, your Dr. Shepard is either nuts or an idiot or the cleverest man alive. I don't know. I do know I believed about one half of what he told me. Maybe less. Well, what reason would he have to lie? Beats me. If someone threatened your life or mine, we'd turn to the police for help. Now, Shepard won't do that. 
insists that it would probably be hazardous in the case of his patient, Mrs. Forbes. Well, I don't want to write up this policy if what he says is true. But I, I don't want to pass up the commission if it isn't true. Can you stick around town for another day or two and find out about it? I'll do what I can, Mr. Porter. Go ahead. Have an aspirin. He had an aspirin and I had a car ride. Once again, out to the offices of Dr. Shepard. The same things were more or less going on in the same way. His nurse, Miss Streeter, appeared as distraught as ever when she recognized me. There was a quick dabbing at the eyes, a straightening of the hair before she spoke. I... Good morning, Mr. Dollar. Hello. I'd like to see the doctor again. He was calling Mr. Porter's office trying to locate you. I'll buzz him. Mr. Dollar, do you have anything to do with why doctor's been carrying a gun? No. That's his business. In other words, I should mind my business. Well, I'm being honest. I've advised him what to do on the matter. What matter? He'll have to explain that to you, Miss Streeter. It doesn't make much sense to me. You can go back now. Okay, thanks. Hello, Mr. Dollar. Hello, Doctor. You were pretty insulting yesterday. I'm sorry about that, but we both have a problem to solve. And I get paid sometimes for deliberately insulting people. <laughs> You're a strange one. Do you want to change your story about all this? I wish I could change it. It's still a mess, a bad mess. I thought it all out last night, and I still must hold to my original thinking. I have to place my concern for my patient, Mrs. Forbes, before anything else. In other words, you won't call the police and tell them your life's been threatened. No, and you're very stubborn about that part. I don't think you comprehend the situation at all. Look, wait a minute. Let's understand each other, Doctor. If this man Forbes is all you say he is, and you say you're the expert on homicidal tendencies then the best thing for you to do is to prefer charges against him for threatening your life and have him locked up. Now, you could do that, according to what you've told me about Mrs. Forbes and a servant in their home witnessing his threats. I will try to explain again. I can't do that for Mrs. Forbes' sake. I just can't. She's been through a shattering ordeal. I must attempt to resolve this quietly. Now, true, I can generally anticipate a man's actions inside my office under clinical conditions, but I... Well, Forbes is different. That's why I tried to contact you today. Someone like you could approach Forbes and possibly persuade him to discard his ideas of violence. Probably do it in a quiet way, too. What does Mr. Porter pay you? Well, what's that got to do with it? I'm willing to pay you. I mean, you and I don't seem to get along very well, but I phone Porter and he tells me you're one of the best men in your line of business. I'll pay you to go to Paul Forbes and talk to him as I've described. <laughs> I can't figure you, Doctor. Now, let you and I not get into any personality arguments. Will you do this for me for your regular fee? I was going to do it anyhow. For Mr. Porter and the fee, he pays me. I just wanted to check you first. I'll do it. But I still think it's a matter for the police. All right, let's leave it this way. You go talk to Forbes. If you think he means to kill me, then I'll call the police and prefer charges against him, patient or no patient. How's that? That sounds a little more sensible, Doctor. I took down the home address of Paul Forbes and climbed to my rented car and drove over to his home in the gilded edge of the city. A story and a half colonial with all the trimmings. Lawns, trees, Plymouth convertible, a push-button station wagon in the garage. It was a nice warm spring day and some flowers were blooming and smelling up the area in a very nice way. Flies buzzed, bees droned, birds sang. And I went up and pressed the doorbell. I should have gone butterfly catching or taken a plane to Spokane. Yeah? I'm looking for Paul Forbes. Does he live here? Yeah, he sure does. I'm Forbes. Mr. Forbes, my name is Johnny Dollar. Dollar? Yeah, and I came over to talk to you... You get out of my way! The front of his gun slapped against the side of my head and I went down to my knees. A door slammed somewhere and someone ran away. I twisted around trying to see what it was all about. And then I managed to get to my feet in time to see Paul Forbes plunging the Plymouth out the driveway and heading I don't know where. Oh, oh. My goodness, my goodness. What happened here? Uh, Where's Mr. Forbes? You hurt? Yeah, I'll be... Oh, Miss Forbes! Miss Forbes! Hey. Oh, let me help you, sir. Yeah, give me your arm. Yeah. We better sit you down over here. Okay, thanks. Oh, my thanks. goodness, my goodness gracious, sir. How did this happen? Mr. Forbes swung a gun at me. Oh, no, sir, no, sir. Oh, no, sir. No, easy, sir. Easy, easy. Thanks, you know, thanks. Let's sit down here. Oh. Oh. What happened here? I'm afraid Mr. Forbes attacked this gentleman, Miss Forbes. Call the doctor up and 
Then go to my medicine chest and get some swabs and a pan of cold oh, water. Right away, Mike. Uh, the doctor isn't necessary. It just made me dizzy. You're cut. It might be deep. Well, get the first aid things and some brandy, Upton. Right away, ma'am. This is unforgivable, just unforgivable conduct. Please, I don't know who you are. Are you a friend of Paul's? No, I'm Johnny Dollar. I, I wanted to discuss with your husband and something. I, I take it you're Mrs. Forbes. Yes. Oh, Upton, uh, set them right here. Yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. You feeling a little better, sir? I, I don't know yet. <clears throat> hey, let me try some of that. Yes, yeah, certainly, sir, certainly. Here we go, sir. <sighs> Easy now. Easy. <laughs> Thanks. How does it look to you, Upton? Well, I believe it's not too deep, Mrs. Forbes. How's it feel, Mr. Dollar? No, I, I don't think it's very deep. I'll be all right in a minute. Upton, go telephone Dr. Shepard and tell him to come over here immediately. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Dollar, I can't tell you how sorry I am for this. You, you can bring suit against us. You can do anything you want to, Mr. Dollar. Paul's temper is just ungovernable these days. He could have killed you. He took the car and ran. Yeah. I don't know what's gotten into him. Two nights ago, he attacked my personal physician, threatened to kill him. And now he's attacked you for no reason at all. Any idea where he might have gone? Heaven only knows. Mad. That's what he is, Mr. Dollar. He's mad. <laughs> Pauline Forbes had a right to be scared from what I'd seen of her and from what I'd seen of her husband. He was an angry man with a gun in his hand, slugging at anyone in sight. She was a distraught woman with a darkening spot underneath her right eye, and it wasn't mascara. I began to wonder who needed more looking after, Dr. Shepard, Mrs. Forbes, or Johnny Dollar. Now, you just lie still now, sir. Uh, well, I guess you kind of fainted a little bit. Is there anything I can get you, sir? No, no, I'm dead. Just tell me about Mr. Forbes. I beg your pardon, sir? Look, I'm an insurance investigator. I came here today to talk to Mr. Forbes about threatening Dr. Shepard's life. Oh, uh, well, I, I wouldn't want to talk out of turn, sir. You, you better discuss that with Ms. Forbes. Now, just one question. Did Mr. Forbes threaten Dr. Shepard's life? Yes, sir. You heard him? I did, sir. He attacked Dr. Shepard here two nights ago. Did he also attack Mrs. Forbes? Mr. Dollar... This is an unhappy house. Things have gone all wrong here these last few months. Mr. Forbes changed. Ms. Forbes, uh, oh, I don't know. I, but please don't ask me to speak up against anyone. I'm just trying to find out the best thing to do for everybody concerned. What can you do, sir? Well, I didn't think anything like this had happened. It's terrible, Doctor. Terrible. This about settles it. Now, I want you to go up to your room and lie down. There's no sense in your getting any more excited. I want to see about Mr. Dollar first. Oh, good morning, Doctor. Hello, Upton. Uh, let's have a look at this, Dollar. Uh, get that light. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. How is it? Well, I don't think it's anything worse than a cut. How do you feel, Dollar? Oh, an aspirin might straighten me out. I hope so. Captain? Uh, yes, I'll get some, sir. <laughs> Dollar, I should have taken your advice yesterday. I'm going to take it now. I'm going to call the police and have this man arrested. He might kill somebody next time. Yeah, am I all right? Sit up. Dizzy? Yeah, a little. That'll wear off. What will they do to Paul? Well, they'll take him into custody and probably talk some sense to him. Oh, this, this is awful. You go up to your room now, Mrs. Forbes. We'll handle this. Oh, Upton, uh, take Mrs. Forbes upstairs. Yes, sir. You just come along, Mrs. Forbes. Thank you. She is not a well woman. She looks all right to me. I wish she were. Uh, I'm going to get an x-ray on that head. Can you come by the office this afternoon? Yeah, I guess so. Uh, give me the police. I doubt if it's concussion or anything like that, but it's best to play safe. You're a safe player all the time, aren't you, doctor? What does that mean? I don't know. Now, look here. I'm not... Hello? Uh, yes. I want to talk to somebody about a threat on my life. I... My name is Shepard, Dr. Charles Shepard. When I left him, he was reporting Paul Forbes to the police. He gave them Forbes' description and the license number of the Plymouth Forbes was driving. I didn't stay beyond that. Maybe I should have. Maybe I should never have left that house. I'm not sure, but if I hadn't left, I might have saved a life. <laughs> Mr. 
Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, well, the big lie is as true as little green apples. Join us, won't you, when I bite into one and spit out a bullet. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Miss Streeter at Dr. Shepard's office. Yes? Dr. Shepard gave me your hotel number. He said you were to come in for a head x-ray. Let me talk to the doctor about that. Well, he's out on house calls right now, Mr. Dollar. He'll be back late this afternoon. He seemed very concerned over... He ought to be. A friend of his banged me on the head with a gun this morning. That's why the x-ray. Well, could you possibly come in and have it made? Doctor was most insistent. (sighs) All right, Miss Streeter. I'll be right over. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Richard Porter, 480 Webster Boulevard, Providence, Rhode Island. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Shepard matter. Expense account item four, one dollar, cab fare, from my hotel to Richard Porter's office. Porter was sympathetic. You know, I feel very responsible for this, Mr. Dollar. I hired you to look into all this. Oh, it'll go away, it'll go away. I've been hit on the head before. Hey, do you have anything to drink in here? Oh, sure, sure. <laughs> you never can tell when a snake will come up and bite you. Yeah. Yeah, here you are. Mm-hmm. Thanks. I suppose you came in to give me your expense sheet now that it's all settled. Not exactly, Mr. Porter. It isn't settled for me. Well, certainly you know I'll assume any medical expenses involved here. That no, I'm not talking in. about that, Mr. Porter. Sit down. <clears throat> now, look, there's something going on here, and we might as well have it out. You hired me to investigate a client who wanted to buy $80,000 worth of straight life insurance, right? Yes. Now, that client explained why he called for that insurance. Not to my satisfaction, but he explained it. He said a man named Paul Forbes had threatened his life. Threatened it because Dr. Shepard had advised Forbes' wife to get a divorce. I know you didn't believe this, but the facts now seem to bear it out. I went over to see Forbes this morning to talk to him about his threats. I managed to get my name out, and Forbes attacked me, so I got this. Then Forbes ran out. Mrs. Forbes and a servant in the house gave me first aid. All the time they were doing it, they were apologizing for Forbes and his violence. Finally, Dr. Shepard came in, called the police, and told them to pick up Forbes. And the police will pick him up if they haven't already, and Dr. Shepard will prefer charges... And that won't be that, Mr. Porter. Not as far as I'm concerned. Dr. Shepard's story is still leaky. I'm sorry, but I think it has more credence than ever in view of what's happened. You told me yourself his wife and the servant admitted Forbes had threatened Dr. Shepard's life. Oh, I believe that part. But Shepard lies so much, you can get to believing him. What lies, for heaven's sake? Oh, for one thing, his reason for not calling the police right away. I mean, about how delicate Mrs. Forbes' condition was. She looked pretty healthy to me this morning. Another thing, he described Forbes as a man with homicidal tendencies. Now, Dr. Shepard's supposed to be an expert on behavior. And he thought that if I talked to Forbes, I might settle the matter peaceably. But Forbes attacked me as soon as I told him my name. I didn't get a chance to talk. Well, Dr. Shepard has no control over... He felt pretty sure I could talk to Forbes. If you don't like that, let me go on. What reason did Forbes have to hit me? He didn't know me from a load of coal. Somebody put him up to it. Who? Who do you think? Shepard, for some reason? Shepard was the only one who knew I was going right over there. But why? I don't know. What would he gain? Uh, My business for an x-ray. You're joking now. I suppose I am, but I got a headache. I feel off. Oh, here. Uh, How about... Mrs. Forbes. Oh, here. Thanks. Oh, she seemed like a genuine enough person. Not sick the way I expected her to be. Someone slugged her recently. There was a bruise under one eye. Mm, Shepard said her husband was an erratic, ruthless, violent man. Well, look, I'm stubborn, Mr. Porter. I still think Shepard's been lying to me. If for no other reason than I think I know the breed. What's all this got to do with the insurance application? Well, that's another thing I don't know. Expense account item five, three dollars, cab fare, to Dr. Shepard's one-story building to have my head x-rayed. Shepard was still out, but Miss Streeter did the honors, almost in silence. Outside of sit still and hold it, nothing much was said. Well, the picture's okay, Mr. Dollar. I looked at it. I didn't see anything wrong. Of course, the doctor will call you when he's had a chance to see it. Swell. You must have got quite a blow. That's a nasty bruise you have. Oh, it's pretty good, all right. He swung his gun hard. 
Oh, the doctor will be back about mid-afternoon. He can call you at your hotel? Yes. Well, thank you for coming in. I want to ask you a question, Miss Streeter. Yes? Are you in love with him? What? Are you in love with Dr. Shepard? Well, that's rather my own business, isn't it? Unless, of course, in your investigation of whatever you're investigating, for some reason I'm under your scrutiny. Well, I suppose it is, and I suppose I can take that to say yes. I become rather angry with you, Mr. Dollar, but frankly, you seem rather ridiculous. I suppose so. He's a liar, isn't he? I mean, Shepard. One more question. I told you on the phone a friend of Dr. Shepard's did this to my head. Now, did you ever ask me who that friend was? Oh, I think you'd be curious about a thing like that, Miss Streeter. I think I have a great deal of work to do, Mr. Dollar. Expense account item six, another three bucks, some more cab fare. This time back to my hotel where I picked up my rented car, filled it with gasoline, item seven, $5.30, and drove out to Pawtucket. At the home of Mrs. Clara Shepard, I explained my name and business to an elderly man who answered the door. He asked me to wait a moment, then returned and said Mrs. Shepard would see me. She was a bright-looking, gray-haired woman in her mid-sixties, elegantly groomed and obviously well cared for. We went through the politenesses, then got down to business. My son applied for $80,000 worth of life insurance and named me beneficiary. That's about it. <laughs> I wonder what he's up to. So do we. You mean, so do I. You don't trust anyone, do you, Mr. Dollar? He said his life had been threatened. He told me he wanted to make certain you were well taken care of in case anything happened to him. Oh. He was lying, wasn't he? I haven't seen him, talked to him, even had a Christmas card from him in three years. Maybe he does worry about his poor old mother now and then. I'm flattered. Well, what you're saying about him isn't very flattering. Oh, I don't think Charles ever thought much of me as a mother. Still doesn't, I'm sorry to admit. But then I don't think too much of him as a son. So there we are. Is it too early for a cocktail, Mr. Dollar? How do you explain him already having a $20,000 policy on himself and wanting to kick it up to a hundred? You the beneficiary. No explanation. That's why I suggested a cocktail. To my friends here... Charles is a successful doctor in Providence who calls me faithfully every day, sends me gifts, and is always assured that I am well and happy and occupied in my old age. I guess I like you, Mr. Dollar, perhaps because, with all your gruffness, you might be nice to your mother. No, Charles and I aren't close. Never have been. I can tell you this. I don't need his closeness, at least not in a financial way. If Charles were to die and I received $100,000, it would mean a rather difficult tax problem. If he were to die, part of me would die too. I'd like you to have just one martini with me, and then you may go. Mr. Dollar. I had the one martini with the tall, stately woman who struggled against tears. It was an old struggle with her, increasingly difficult, I guess, as the years kept on. We talked no more of her son or the insurance or the threat on his life. I left there about four o'clock in the afternoon. I drove back over to Providence and got to Dr. Shepard's office about a quarter to six. A broad-shouldered man in a tweed suit was in the reception room. He got to his feet when I walked in. Dr. Shepard? No. Don't I know you? Yeah, I was thinking the same. Wait a minute. Yeah, your name is uh, Dollar, your insurance investigator. Yeah, uh, you're <laughs> Phil so... Crosby, yeah. Providence Police. <laughs> well, I met oh, you boy. in New Hartford once. Oh, I didn't know you were down here. Hey, you must be the one. This Dr. Shepard called downtown about a threat in his life and said an insurance investigator had been slugged trying to help him out of it. Yeah, that's right. Well, where is he? I don't know. I rang that buzzer there. There's no one around at all. What's this all about? Well, a man named Paul Forbes threatened the doctor's life. He slugged me. You got a pickup out on him yet? No, not yet. Try to pin the doctor down all day long. Been out on house calls, emergencies, everything else. We have to get his signature on a complaint. Mm, I thought that was all taken care of by now. Uh, well, hello. Oh, hello. Well, hello, 
Mr. Dollar. Hello, Miss Streeter. This is Phil Crosby from the police department. Police? I'd like to see Dr. Shepard, miss. Is anything the matter? Just want to see him. Oh, well, goodness, he was here ten minutes ago. He sent me over to the pharmacy to pick up these things. Oh. What? We had an emergency. 1213 Putnam Street. Got a note from him? Yes. May I see it, please? With no name on this, Miss Streeter. You recognize the address at all? No, I don't. Doctor wouldn't take a random emergency unless it were very unusual. This might be unusual, Phil. This is down by the water. How bad off do you think Forbes is? Mad, had a gun, plenty rough. I rode down in the police car with Phil Crosby. I had a feeling about the acuteness of that emergency. As a matter of fact, I had a feeling about the acuteness of everything that had happened that day from the time a half-crazed man had slugged me with a gun. The feeling was heavier than ever when we hit the neighborhood. Come on. All right. Wait. How oh, Twelve thirteen Putnam Street. That'd have to be that vacant lot over there. This is twelve forty here. The rest belongs to the warehouse. Yeah. Phil. Huh? That car empty in the plates. Yeah. Yeah, that's Doctor Shepard's car. Motor's still warm. Must be around here somewhere looking for the address. That's a dead end there. I better call in for some help. Fog's coming in if he's wandering around here. Yeah. Phil Crosby went off to find a telephone and request help. I stood by Dr. Shepard's car, waiting and listening and smoking. Nothing happened. No one cried out. No guns went off. Then Crosby drove up in the police car. Come on, report's in. A report was in, all right. We drove two blocks down the street where a small, curious crowd of people had already gathered in the cheerless fog. A uniformed man from the harbor division was standing over what appeared to be a bundle of clothes lying in a heap. We bent over it, and Phil looked up at me with a question mark. That Shepard, Johnny? Yeah, that's him. Yep, I'd say he's been dead less than half an hour. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a liar's still lying, even though he's dead. Join us, won't you, and I'll tell you all about it. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Bill Crosby, Dollar. Were you in bed? No. Nope. Good. Put on your coat and come on downtown. Can't it wait till morning? Nope. Want me to send somebody out to pick you up? Are you talking about an arrest? I might be, Dollar. Whatever I have to do to keep you around. I'll make it under my own steam, pal. Fifteen minutes. Room 203 City Hall, okay? I may take 16 minutes if I feel like it. And maybe you'll need longer. I want a real good story about Paul Forbes. A better one than you've told so far. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Richard Porter, 480 Webster Boulevard, Providence, Rhode Island. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Shepherd matter. Swindle sheet item 7, 10 cents, one newspaper. It carried the story of Dr. Shepherd's murder and told how his life had been threatened by Paul Forbes earlier in the week. Obviously, Dr. Charles Shepherd had been lured to his death by Forbes who had telephoned him, pretended to need a physician, waited until the victim appeared, and then shot him down. The police had an APB out for Paul Forbes. All parties concerned were notified. The deceased was survived by his mother, Mrs. Clara Shepherd of Pawtucket. Amen. Come right in, Dollar. Sit down. There were about six people in Crosby's office, among them Richard Porter, who had hired me to investigate Shepard because of a suspicious insurance application. A uniformed officer from the Harbor Patrol who had discovered Shepard's body. 
and two other men from Crosby's staff. I told them how I had been hired, that I didn't believe all of Shepard's story about the threat on his life. I told them about Forbes slugging me for no apparent reason. I also mentioned the insurance matter had never been satisfactorily explained. Well, it's never going to be explained as far as I can see, Dollar. Oh, I'll find an explanation, Phil. You solve your murder and I'll do what I have We've to do. We've got it solved. All you have to do is pick up Forbes. You know that. I don't know anything. You get huffy with me on the phone and you start talking about arrest and I don't know anything. You said that when you went to see Shepard yesterday morning, he waved a gun at you, a 32. That's right. It wasn't on his body. He knew Forbes hadn't been picked up. His life was in as much danger as ever. Why didn't he carry the gun? You know, that's a pretty good question, Phil. Yeah. What else? He allegedly went out on an emergency call tonight. No little black bag in his car. No little black bag by his body. What doctor goes out on any call without his bag? Oh, I wouldn't let that worry me so much. I'd find out if it was an emergency. Or he knew who was going to meet him when he went out. I thought you might have some ideas. Have you talked to Mrs. Forbes? Of course I've talked to her. She hasn't any idea where her husband might be hiding. She's sure he killed Dr. Shepard. That servant in the house is sure. He told me about Shepard being threatened by Forbes. Shepard told you about being threatened. Forbes slugged you, slugged Mrs. Forbes. Been running around town like a madman all day. But everything you say and every way you say it, it comes out Shepard was lying. I did it on purpose. I wanted to worry you to death. Uh, well, every officer in this town has Forbes' description and the license of his car. We ought to get him before the night's out. He's the boy. Good luck, Phil. He was a good policeman with a lot of doubts. And he was mad about them. And that's what it generally takes to get matters straightened out. I found Kareem Streeter at the morgue, standing beside the marble slab on which a late employer had been laid. She looked pale and wan in her stiff white uniform and blue nurse's cape. Her eyes were red with tears, but no sound escaped her. Then she looked up at me once, sighed, and started out of the place. Wait. Oh, no. Well, I'd... I'd like to help you. I... Can you help him? No. No, you can't. No one can. I tried. Who did it? Well, the, the police say Paul Forbes shot him. It looks that way from all they can gather. Over Mrs. Forbes? Yes. Oh. They're looking for him, I suppose? Yes. Well, there's something of a policeman, Mr. Dollar. Why aren't you out helping them or something? Please, Miss Streeter, I know we've I'll had words. i that question you asked me earlier today. What? You asked me if I loved Dr. Shepard. Yes, Mr. Dollar, I loved him. I loved him more than my whole life. <laughs> when she said that, and for some reason I don't know... I had a feeling that I was hearing the first bit of unembroidered truth I'd heard in two days. It didn't make me feel any better, but it did clear up something that had been in the back of my mind working its way to the front. Expense account item eight, six dollars and seventy cents. A steak, three martinis, and an order of sliced tomatoes. I finished eating at 2.30 in the morning. I really didn't want it, but I did want to sit down and do some thinking. After that, I climbed into my rented car and drove out to Dr. Shepard's office building. Expense account item nine, five dollars even. Bribe for watchman. I shouldn't be doing this, you know. Might lose my job over it. But since you're from the insurance company, I guess you're all right. I sure appreciate it. Eh, too bad about Dr. Shepard. Nice fella. Yeah, very nice. What is it you think you'll find? Police been here till almost an hour ago, poking around. You know if they found anything? Oh, sure. Doctor's emergency kit. Heard him say he didn't take it with him when he went out in that last emergency. Uh-huh. Well, I won't be long. Oh, no, I'm going to come right in and watch you. Shepard had been a thorough man, and from all evidence, he and Miss Streeter kept and operated an efficient file system in the office. However, he had kept no medical history of his prime patient, Pauline Forbes. As a matter of fact, in checking over both the patient's files and the card files, there was no evidence to indicate that Mrs. Forbes had ever been a patient of Shepard's. Which seems strange in view of the fact that he told me he treated her for 14 months or better and ended the treatment by advising her to divorce her husband. What's more, he had never mentioned that Paul Forbes had been one of his patients. But an entry dated some two years before disclosed the fact that Dr. Shepard had examined, treated, and discharged Paul Forbes as a patient. These two developments supplied me with all of the curiosity I'd need for a while. Nurse Corrine Streeter's home address was duly noted on Dr. Shepard's phone book, Oakdale House, surprisingly enough, on Oakdale Street. Special rates for nurses. Room 205. Yes? Oh, Mr. Dollar. How do you feel? 
Not too good, Mr. Dollar. I only got home about 15 minutes ago. They kept me down there pretty long. Then Dr. Shepard's mother came. Do you want to come in? Yeah, thanks. It isn't much of a place, is it? I mean, I haven't straight... Well, things... <laughs> things like tonight aren't easy, I know, but... Look, Miss Streeter, I wish you'd help me and tell me who Dr. Shepard was intending to marry. Marry? Oh, I had no idea. I was in the office a half an hour ago. He'd already made arrangements for a honeymoon, reservations on the Ile de France for next June. Any ideas? Please go. I can't. Look, I'm not here to hurt you. I'm here to help. I mean... Was it Mrs. Forbes? What? Look, Miss Streeter, things are all wrong about your doctor's death, about what happened before it. It'll all come out sooner or later. Oh, I suppose it will. It's awful to say this, Mr. Dollar, but Mrs. Forbes was the only person doctors saw socially this last year. And she, of course, is married. How'd they meet? When her husband was Dr. Shepard's patient? Yes, that's right. They became quite friendly. Mrs. Forbes was never a patient, but Mr. Forbes was... Now, what can you tell me about Mr. Forbes? Well, he came to see Dr. Shepard a year or two ago and stopped coming in. I believe he requested a copy of his medical history to be sent to another doctor in Baltimore, I think it was. Uh Uh-huh. But Dr. Shepard kept right on seeing Mrs. Forbes. Yes. All right. Do you have any idea why I was called in by the insurance broker? At first, I didn't. But I I don't understand what you're trying to do. The police want Mr. Forbes. What does it all mean? It'll sicken you, Miss Streeter. Oh, tell me if you know. Tell me, please. It means the wrong man was killed tonight. I was pretty sure of what I meant when I said that. And I was also pretty sure that Phil Crosby and the police department had recognized the setup. It so happened I had a head start in the way of information. And though it was six o'clock in the morning by that time, I decided to use it. Mr. Dollar. Hello, Mrs. Forbes. I'd like to come in. What is it? I should have tumbled to it right away, but your husband fit the part too well. Look here. I've been through quite enough today with the police and all out looking for Paul and Dr. Shepard being killed. Stop looking pained and tired. I'm the guy that's tired. I'm the one who was going to be the star witness when the state tried Shepard for killing your husband. What? Why not get a star witness for free? Why not make a suspicious insurance move so an investigator would be called in? An investigator who'd back up a self-defense plea for your doctor and get him off on justifiable homicide. Get out of here. Get out of here, I'll call the police. And you and the doctor sail to France in June and live happily ever after? What's the matter? Wouldn't your husband give you a divorce? Go ahead. If you say it's that way, Mr. Dollar, and you know everything, then it must have been that way. Only it got fouled up. Your husband did shoot your boyfriend after all, just as he threatened to. Get out of here! You can't prove any of it, not one word of it. Oh, you're right about that, Mrs. Forbes. I can't prove anything, not a thing. Shepard's dead, and they want your husband for it. He threatened Shepard, and they'll get him for it, and that's that. But you have something to live with for the rest of your life. Your doctor's gone. He'll never come back. Or maybe you can just have a cup of coffee and forget all about it. Get out! Get out! Leave me alone! Leave me alone! What? Yeah, that's it, Phil. That's what was supposed to happen. Shepard had it planted all over town how Forbes had threatened his life. He had witnesses. He had me, even. All he had to do was go out and shoot Forbes any place, any time. But Forbes got him first. Can people get by with this kind of thing in our courts of law? If and when you get your hands on Paul Forbes, will he have any kind of defense? Oh, he'll get him, Dollar. The other I can't answer. What you just told me can't be proven. I don't see how a lawyer can do much for a guy who threatens another man's life and then finally guns him down, do you? But it was Forbes who was the marked man all this time. He was supposed to die. If it could be proved that Forbes was a patsy, that the doctor intended to gun him down... Up to the judge and jury, Johnny. When we get Forbes, he'll be arraigned and indicted for first-degree murder. Don't worry about that part. But the rest is up to the court, out of our hands. After all, we're pretty sure Forbes shot and killed Dr. Shepard. Hang up that phone, Dollar. You still on the wire, Johnny? Hang it up or I'll blow your head off. Paul Forbes looked the part of a fugitive... His coat was ripped in several places. The knuckles on his left hand were torn and raw. There was mud on his shoes and pant legs. His eyes told the rest of the story. He was blazing mad. He had a gun. And he wasn't afraid to use it. Now, 
here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow I find out how hard it is to kill a lie. Sometimes you have to kill it twice. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is the hotel operator, Mr. Dollar. Will you cut off? I, uh... Tell her not to let any more calls in here. Go on! I was cut off, but I'd rather get some sleep now. Anybody phones, just take a message. All right, Mr. Dollar. Over there. Sit down. Put your hands on your knees. Now, just so as you and I understand each other. You make one move. Wiggle a finger, I'll empty this gun right in your stomach. You understand me? I understand you, Forbes. You're crazy. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To Richard Porter, 480 Webster Boulevard, Providence, Rhode Island. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Shepherd matter. I was pretty sick of it and with it when I had Paul Forbes visit me in my hotel room about 7 o'clock in the morning. He used a gun in front of me once before to crack my skull. I decided I'd try to avoid that again. So I sat down and I played good. It didn't seem to please him a bit. You were out to my house about an hour ago, weren't you? Yeah, I went out to talk to your wife. Yeah, I saw you. I was across the street watching. I followed you here. Fixing up another deal, huh? I don't know what you're talking about, Forbes. I followed you here so we could have a little talk. And we're going to have it, you and I. You ought to put that gun away and let them take you, Forbes. Where do you live? In Hartford, Connecticut. I mean, where do you live in town here in Providence? I don't. I live in Hartford. Where do you practice? Practice what? Are you trying to get funny with me? I don't practice anything here in Providence. I don't live here. I'm just here for a few days. Doing what? Working on an insurance matter. Insurance matter? You're licensed to practice law in Rhode Island? Oh, you've got something all wrong, Forbes. I don't practice law. I'm not a lawyer. I'm an insurance investigator. I tried to tell you that yesterday morning when you cracked me with that gun. I was called in by Dr. Shepard. He said you threatened his life. You're lying to me. Shepard called me yesterday morning and said a lawyer named Dollar was on his way over to talk to me about getting Pauline a divorce. You're a lawyer! I'm what I say I am. If you hadn't started swinging that gun butt around, I'd have told you why I was there yesterday. You got a billfold or something? My coat pocket inside on the back of that chair there. I think I know why Shepard called you and told you I was a lawyer. I think he wanted you to attack me and make me Shut a... Shut up! You and Shepard are trying to pull something to take my wife away from me. I know that much. And now you're trying to pull something to get out of this jam. You're wrong, Forbes. I don't know anything about trying to take your wife away from you. You know I didn't kill Shepard. How do I know you didn't kill him? You threatened him. Half a dozen people have attested to that. I know you had a reason to kill him. I know every time I've seen you, you had a gun in your hands and you've been swinging it at somebody, particularly me. You know who did it. You're in on it somewhere... You know who killed Shepard, and you're going to clear me. You're going to tell me, Dollar. I'm going to whip it out of you. You're going to crazy. (laughs) All right. Get on your feet. He sat in the chair just the way I propped him there. His eyes looked dull and lifeless, as though he were already dead. I couldn't think of anything brilliant to say or do, so I rummaged around my suitcase and pulled out a bottle. Then I found a pair of glasses in the bathroom and poured a couple of drinks. When I came on out, he hadn't moved from the chair. He looked crumpled like a worn-out suit of clothes. He made no effort to look at me when I tucked the glass in his hand. Here, try this. Go on, go on, drink it. Why don't you call the police? Now, you say you followed me here to have a talk and find out what's what. Now's the time to talk, pal. This thing isn't the best conversation piece in the world. Leave me alone. Call him in. You have something going for you here. This gun hasn't been fired. Do you have another one? No. 
No, Dollar, I didn't kill Dr. Shepard. I wanted to more than anything in the world. But I didn't kill him. Now, look, I want some facts. So let's start with last night. Where were you when Shepard was shot? How do I know where I was? I... Uh... I don't even know what time he was shot. All right, let's start with yesterday morning. You slugged me, ran out of the house, jumped in a car, and what happened? Go on, take it from there. I drove over to Dr. Shepard's office. I was going to have it out with him. He was breaking up my home. Well, go on. Did you see him? No. I parked down the street from his office, and then I saw him jump in his car, and I followed him. He came back over here. I knew my wife must have called him to take care of you. What happened then? I went over to the park and... sat and tried to figure things out. You don't know what I've been through this past year. All right, go on, go on. Then I went to a bar. I was hungry. I hadn't eaten all day. I got a couple of sandwiches and then I had some drinks. I don't know how many. Anyhow, the, the more I drank... The more hopeless everything looked. Did you call Shepard? Yeah. Yeah, I, I called him from the bar. Any idea what time it was? Must have been around five or six. What difference does it all make? I'm cooked and you know it. Go on, will you? You called Shepard. Then what did you do? I told him I wanted to talk to him about everything that had happened. I told him where to meet me. You mean you wanted Dr. Shepard to come down and meet you so you could kill him? Maybe I did have that in my mind. I don't know. On the phone, he sounded so calm and said we could talk it out and straighten it out like gentlemen. Did you talk to him? No. I didn't see him at all. I waited an hour and he never showed up. I called his office back and the answering service said everyone had gone out for the day and I, I didn't know what to do. I got back in my car and turned on the radio and that's where I heard I was wanted for murder. Dollar, I didn't do it. I swear I didn't. I had reason enough, but I didn't. I knew all about the others, but this was wait serious. Minute, wait a minute, what others? Pauline's always had other friends. <laughs> friends. I, I guess... I don't, know, I, don't, I don't guess I love her anymore. I don't know. I don't think she ever loved me. But I needed her. I needed her more than anything this last year or so. And at times, I, I did love her the way it once was. And I found out what was going on between her and Shepard. She wanted a divorce. I wouldn't give her a divorce. If I had let her and Shepard get away with it, it would have been too much to take, to ask. Oh, this doesn't make sense. Even though you didn't love her and she didn't love you, you wouldn't stand still for a divorce action? It sounds stupid. I just told you. I needed her so much this last year or so. So much. Still doesn't make any sense, Forbes. Why didn't you let her go? She knew she didn't have to divorce me. She knew it wouldn't be too long. What? Shepard gave me a year. Another doctor in Baltimore, 18 months. Leukemia. Don't you see? She would have been free. They could have waited until I was dead at least. Just that until I was dead. Couldn't they? Well, couldn't they? Expense account item 10, $2, sleeping pills. I fed them to him along with a cup of hot chocolate. He looked pretty worn out, and within 15 minutes he was sound asleep in my bed. Item 11, $4.16, one long distance phone call to a Baltimore clinic where I spoke with a Dr. Franz Mueller. Dr. Mueller confirmed what Forbes had said. Forbes was doomed with an incurable ailment. Item 12, 20 cents, another phone call. This one from the hotel lobby to the coroner's office. I learned that Shepard had been killed by 32 caliber slugs. Forbes' gun, a 32, had not been fired or hastily cleaned. His story was checking out. That left just one small item to be cleared up. Expense account item 13, $4. Taxi fare from my hotel back to the Oakdale home. Special rates for nurses. Hello. I thought you'd be back to see me. Somehow I'm glad it's you, Mr. Dollar. Go ahead. That's an old story. Terribly old and corny. 
I applied for a job as Dr. Shepard's nurse five years ago, and I fell in love with him that very day. I've loved him every day from that time on. Five years. Go on. I don't know when it was when he started up with Mrs. Forbes. I knew she was trying to get a divorce. I knew Mr. Forbes wouldn't stand for it. Then one day, last week I guess it was, I heard Doctor talking to her on the phone. He said, there's a way to get rid of him. I knew he was talking about getting rid of Mr. Forbes. Did they discuss the part about Shepard getting Forbes to threaten his life in front of witnesses so he could shoot him down when the time came? No, I didn't know that until yesterday morning. So long ago, it seems. You came to see Doctor, and then you left. I overheard him on the phone again. He called up Mr. Forbes and said Mr. Dollar was coming over to talk about the divorce action. And he knew Forbes would be upset enough to attack me. Doctor was very good about anticipating what people would do in given situations. <laughs> Even me. I was in the office when Mr. Forbes called last night. I saw a doctor put the gun in his coat. I knew he was going down to meet Mr. Forbes and shoot him, so I followed him. He was walking around in the dark looking for Mr. Forbes with a gun in his hand. I ran up to him and pleaded with him not to be crazy, that Mrs. Forbes wasn't worth it. Then he said he was going to kill me, too. We struggled. The gun went off. I don't know how many times. I can help you, Corinne. He didn't mean to kill him. He meant to shoot you. When all these other details come out, the most they can charge you with is secondary justifiable or manslaughter. No. You're nice. But I can't get off. Huh? I guess the police haven't found her yet. I went over and killed Mrs. Forbes an hour ago. <laughs> Expense account item 14, same as item 1, transportation back to Hartford. The next time you have a doubtful insurance application, Mr. Porter, settle it yourself or call someone else. Don't call me. As far as I can add up, and I'm not going to recheck the figures, expense account total is $485. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's intriguing story. Next week, the case of a lonely heart that found plenty of company in the nearest morgue. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Gene Bates... Virginia Gregg, Russell Thorson, Parley Bear, Herb Ellis, Barney Phillips, and Lawrence Dobkin. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking.